found in our Lord. Alleluia. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Alleluia. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. The man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, Jesus, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. If you ask my wife, she will tell you it's true. I like to shop. Yes, he does. <laughs> One of my favorite places, though, is Lowe's. Home Depot, second. And every time I need to get something from there because I'm doing a project or something, I know what I need to buy. And I race right in there, and I've got the store memorized. I can pretty much tell you what aisle things should be in by now. But I never go right to that aisle. I tend to walk up and down each aisle because there might be something new. And just as sure as I'm standing in front of you, every time I go up and down those aisles, I see something that I need. And so I carry all of my finds up to the register, and when I get to the register, wow, that total is always more than I thought it should be. There have been days that I've actually had to put things back because I didn't have enough to cover all of my needs and my wants. I think this morning in our lesson today, this young man was in the same predicament, except it wasn't at Lowe's or Home Depot, it was actually speaking with God. But he didn't realize that this was God, because as you hear, as he first addresses Jesus, he tries to give him some honor that is due to him, but he only gives him the honor due like maybe a rabbi. He greets him and says, good teacher. You see, he was looking through his eyes and seeing only the man that was standing in front of him. He was not looking through the eyes of faith because then he would have noticed it was God standing in front of him. And Jesus saw this man and immediately he loved this man. 
Even though he knew what this man was about, even though he knew how he lived his life, even though he knew all about what he would do, whether it was beforehand or to come after, Jesus still looked at this man and loved him. How do I know that? Well, it does say that in our gospel halfway through, but even in that address that he gave to Jesus, good teacher. Now, Jesus could have clapped back at him and said, I am God, get on your knees. And if you don't, I'm going to turn you into an iguana and you can spend the rest of your life that way. But he doesn't do that, does he? In love, Jesus simply says to him, why do you call me good? For only God is good. You see, he was trying to tell this person standing in front of him in his gentle and loving way that he could who he really was. If only God is good and you call me good, then I must be <coughs> God. He could have sent a lightning bolt. But instead, he chose to love this person right from the get-go, even though he knew his heart. This young man says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit a place in God's kingdom to come? I want you to think about those words. He was sugarcoating a lot of things, and he was asking Jesus a question, but that's not the question that he was asking Jesus, was it? What must I do to inherit a place in God's kingdom to come? Does anybody see a problem with that statement or that question? Let me ask you this. Have you ever inherited something? I have. My dad's theology books. For some reason, he wanted me to have them. And my stepmother was more than happy to box them all up for me after he passed away. They were even more happy to deliver them to the office. And I got to cart them upstairs and go through case after case after case of theological works that I didn't need. But my father wanted me to have them. I inherited these books. Let me ask you a few questions. Those books that I received, did I buy them? No. Did I earn them? No. Did I even ask for them? <laughs> no. You see, that's an inheritance. I earn a paycheck. I do that by expending a lot of time and a lot of energy. And I get compensated for that. That is how you earn something. It's by your actions that you are doing, and then somebody pays you for that. That is how you earn it. So what was this young man really asking Jesus? Jesus, how do I inherit a spot in God's kingdom? Because if that were true, if that were actually the question he was asking, he already had his answer. <clears throat> you inherit it because it is given to you. You inherit it because somebody loves you enough that they left it for you. That's not the question he asked, though, is it? Those are the words, but the question he asked was really, Jesus, how do I earn my way into heaven? What must I do? How much does it cost? That's the real question. That's the question that young man was really asking God. And Jesus looks at him, still loving him. And he said, well, look at the commandments. Honor your mother and father. Check. Do not steal. Check. Do not murder. Check. Do not cover, covet your neighbor's possessions. Check. Jesus, all these things I've done since I was young. Now notice Jesus only brings up the fourth through the tenth commandments. You ever find that interesting in this passage? He was only bringing up commandments four through ten because those commandments dealt with how we treat each other in this world. He didn't bring up one through three because I already knew his answer, didn't he? 
See, 4 through 10 is how he lived his life in regards to his neighbor and to his parents and those around him. Jesus already knew how he made out of the first commandment. Of course, this young man was overjoyed. Jesus, I got this. I passed the test. I have done everything that God requires of me. Does that mean I get in now? Give me the secret handshake, please. And God looks at him and says, you only lack one thing. And this is what we hear in the gospel, and he says this with great love. You only lack one thing. Sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Yeah. I recognize that look on that guy's face. That look of, oh crap, I can't do this. I can't possibly do this for what would I have left. He walked away grieving, it is said, knowing that he could not buy his way into heaven, knowing that whatever he was doing, it would not be enough to have a place in God's kingdom. Guess what? We can't either. We cannot earn enough. We cannot do enough. We cannot bribe God enough with money or anything else to get us a spot in His kingdom. So if anybody was trying to do that, forget it. Doesn't happen. Now I'm not saying that we we cannot serve the church and serve others. I'm not saying that everybody now can just leave their positions as council members or any other thing that we need to help this church run. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I'm very thankful for everybody that does what they do around here. But what God is telling us through this young man is that if we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then we will have an inheritance, which means that we will know God and we will know God in His kingdom. And what do we have to do for that? <clears throat> Nothing. Jesus is the one that was going to do all the heavy lifting. Jesus was the one who was on the way to the cross. Jesus was the one who was going to take our sins upon himself and die on that cross so that when he died, our sins died with him. So therefore, he was the one that would make us right with God. And what part do we play in that? We just show up. That's all we do. We believe. You see, that's what Jesus was trying to tell this young man. That's the reason why Jesus didn't ask him about commandments one through three. First commandment is that I am the Lord your God. Have no other gods before me. The guy couldn't say yes on that one, could he? How do we know that? Because he put his faith in his wealth and his position rather than his faith in God. That's why he couldn't sell everything he had. He wasn't willing to say, God, I trust you. I know that if I sell everything because you asked me to do it, if I sell everything, I know I will not have to worry. Because you will make sure that in this life I have everything I need. I learned that lesson this weekend, as I told you this morning, that I was driving down to where we were going to meet our friends and meet new friends to be able to officiate at a wedding for CJ. But on the way down, my focus was not so much on the wedding and the things to come, not even on the driving that I had to do, which was extremely painful from the get-go, but what was on my mind first and foremost was, what am I going to do to get into a refrigerator freezer? Where am I going to pull that money out? And the answer quite simply was, I don't know. And yet, I kept that in my mind. That was forefront in my mind the entire way down until my wife sat me down and said, look, I'm not worried about it, so you shouldn't be there. I don't know how, but I know it will happen. 
You see, I was in the same position as that young man standing before Jesus. I was trying to rely on everything I knew. I was trying to rely on what I knew we had and how we couldn't afford to do what needed to be done. Instead of saying, God, I entrust this into your hands, I tried to do the heavy lifting. And even on the way home, I failed miserably on that. You see, that's what this young man was doing. He was looking at all that he owned and trying to figure out how it was that he could get his way into heaven. And then Jesus tells him, sell it all. What Jesus was saying was, trust in God. When you trust in God, then everything will work out. Now, I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know why. I don't know any of the particulars. But I do know it will work out. And that's the lesson that I had to learn this weekend. It is a lesson I've learned before in my life, but I have to keep learning these lessons. And I'm grateful that God is such a loving God that he allows me to learn these lessons and relearn these lessons. That is the depth of his love, and that is the love that he was looking at this young man with. Knowing that this young man was lost, that he needed direction. He didn't need correction, he needed love and patience and time. And God gives us those things, doesn't he? He doesn't expect that we're going to come to faith and come to church every Sunday and walk away from here and say, okay, this is it. I'm dedicating my life to God. From today, right now, I am going to be 100% in God's corner. That I'm going to believe everything that is said in Scripture about God right now. Because you probably blew that already. Our minds might already be wandering. Our minds might be thinking, well, you know what? I haven't killed anybody. I'm good. I haven't stole from anybody. I'm okay. You probably went down that same list as, as I was reading off the gospel, and you're probably saying, I'm good. I'm okay. Compared to a lot of people, I am pretty good. And then at the end, we might even say, well, psh, if a rich man can't get through the eye of a needle, I'm okay because I'm not rich. Do you have running water in your house? You're rich. Do you have a house? You're rich. Do you, are you able to eat your meals whenever you want them and know that you have enough to eat in your household at any given time? You are rich. Are you able to walk outside of your house without being shot at or without being well, without being accosted because you are different from someone else, you are rich. That if we look at where we stand in this world, we are in the top 15% just by being born in the country we are born into. That according to the standards of the rest of the world, everybody in this, not only in this church, but in this area, is rich. And so what Jesus says to this young man applies to each and every one of us. That it would be easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into God's kingdom. And why is that? Because of the resources we have, we want to rely on our resources instead of relying on God. And that's where we mess up. God doesn't say you need to sell everything you have. God just says, if I come to you and tell you to do that, you need to trust in me and do that. So no, we don't have to get rid of our houses and our cars. We don't have to give away everything we have. But if God tells us to, well, then we should trust in him to do it. Again, this weekend, I learned that lesson once again. That when I try and take care of things my way, it's always the wrong way. When we rely on ourselves, we are already lost. We have already blown the game because we are no longer putting God in first position. We are putting 
your soul is there. And here's a news flash in case you haven't gotten it yet. We can't do it ourselves. That is the message of the Bible. We are not good enough. We are not strong enough. We don't have the abilities. We don't have the power. We don't have enough resources. On our own, we are abject failures. But the good news is we are not alone. We have someone who is stronger than all. We are someone who can do the impossible, and he does that in our lives each and every day. That he loves us even on our worst days. And yet, even on our best days, we don't deserve any of that love. And yet, God still does the impossible and still says, you are my beloved child. God says that because you believe that Jesus is my son, that he is of me and I am in him, then you do have a place in my kingdom. And yes, I know you're going to mess up between now and that time, but you still have that place. You see, that's the possible being coming from the impossible. That is God saying that if you believe, it is already happening. That as I sent Jesus in the world to save the world, once you believe in that, you already have a place in my kingdom. And you can't lose that place. That's what God wanted this man who was standing in front of him to know. And yet that man could not grasp the hold of that. That man could not trust in God enough. And so he walked away grieving. If you don't think that's true, then when you come forward as we share this meal of Holy Communion, I want you to remember that God is still calling you to come forward, that he is still offering the body and blood of Christ as the visible sign of his forgiveness and his love. That once you receive that body and blood and you take that in you, that is God saying, I still love you. I still have your back. And I forgive you for your doubt. I forgive you when you are unfaithful. I forgive you when you can't <coughs> me. And you try and do it on your own. It's a shame that we have to hit rock bottom before we're willing to say, God, okay, take over. Wouldn't it be great if we could just tag out at the beginning and say, God, I know you got this. I'll take care of some of this other stuff. But I'm going to give you the heavy stuff. That's what God wants. And yet we find that the hardest to do, isn't it? We have a hard time letting it go because we want to be self-made people. Well, again, another news flash. You can't make enough. You can't do enough. On your own, you're just going to flop. But with God, all things are possible. That young man walked away. And some of Jesus' disciples were perplexed. Well, then Jesus, how is it this will happen? How can it be? Trust. That's the word. That's the same word we use for faith, isn't it? Believe that I am the Son of God. Believe that I've been sent by my Father. When you believe this, well, then things change. Not only do you have a place in God's kingdom, but then you will be doing those things that will glorify God. And when you do those things that glorify God, then you're not so worried about building up your IRAs. You're not so worried about building up your bank account. You're not so worried about getting into the bigger house or the better cars. Rather, you are doing those things for God and doing them to honor and glorify His name. And therefore, you are actually building up your treasures in heaven rather than treasures that you can't take with you. Think about that. I've told you before, I 
I've seen that bumper sticker. It says the hearse does not have a towage. You cannot take it with you. So why bother? Stockpiling all that stuff now. Why not look for the long term? Build up your heavenly treasures. No, you cannot get in good with God by doing those things because then we're already sinning. But if we do all things to honor and glorify God's holy name, that is when those treasures begin to increase in God's kingdom. And if we are doing things to honor and glorify God's name, then we know we're on the right track. And we are no longer being selfish. We are no longer thinking about ourselves. We are no longer then worrying about what will happen. We are then telling God without having to say the words that you are my God and I have no other gods before you. Because I'm betting a farm on you. And if we truly lead our lives that way, we will be different. We will be doing what God asks us to do in this world. We will be feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving those who thirst a cup of water, visiting those in prison and those who are sick. When we do the least to the least of these, we are doing that to God. But we gotta trust before it can happen. That's all we can do. And that's what Jesus invites us, who would be his disciples, to do. And instead of turning away and grieving, we might say, God, forgive me. I was wrong. God, I should have trusted in you from the very beginning. God, I should not have worried because even though I did not know how, I knew that you were going to provide for my family and I. And you did. I didn't expect. And when Jim sat me down, well, because my wife had been talking to me pretty much the whole weekend about it, that when Jim sat me down, there wasn't a fight. There was just that moment of stubbornness and hesitation, but when I looked in my wife's eyes, I understood what God was telling me. Very simply, he was saying, Ron, I got this. Just receive. And so I will tell you the same thing. No matter what you will face this day or any other day, remember, hear the words of God. I got this. 